like low should be allowed uh as opposed to like kill bill which is kind of more of a it i mean it should feel loud as well but it, it it's it's kind of a little bit more of a subdued dynamic so every time i'm setting levels i not only want things to just be at the same volume but i want their dynamics on an album to make sense this right here is mastering engineer dale becker dale's mastered some of today's biggest hits including jack harlow's first class doja cat's planet her and the album we're going to talk about today, which is SZA's SOS. So stay tuned as we talk about the mastering process behind the album. And we're also going to go over Dale Becker's mastering setup and mastering chain, which you will not want to miss. If there's a mastering chain, like a Dale Becker mastering chain, you know. If I were to bring it back to what happens 90% of the time, it's... One thing I noticed is it seems like your studio in, in the last couple of years has uh, really kind of evolved. When I was looking at pictures of your studio from the beginning, you had, you know, the Lipinski monitors, you had mm -hmm. like analog gear all around you, but I believe your new studio, it's way more minimalist, right? There's like, you have your monitor, you have a beautiful Dolby Atmos setup and your analog gear is more to the sides. What was the evolution of that setup? Yeah. When I, when I got started, um, using a computer for anything other than capturing a master was absolutely not allowed. Um, I even had clients like, you know, I, I did a lot of work back in the day with Eddie Kramer and he didn't even want digital gear, non-computer digital gear. It needed to be all analog, which is understandable and it's respectable. Um, and that's the way people did things. They only wanted analog. Um, and the computer was just there to play back and capture, you know, the audio. And so you needed a ton of different, um, you needed a lot of different kinds of, of equipment because you needed, multi-band compression, you needed, um, you needed brick wall limiters, you needed different EQs, you needed all that stuff on the outside of the computer because you really weren't allowed, it, it was kind of looked down upon to use anything other than analog equipment. Even though we were using some digital stuff like the Weiss and we, I used to use the, and I still have them to this day, I'll never get rid of them, but the, the original Waves L2 was not a plug-in it was a box you know it was a digital box aes in aes out time went along and and um i remember when steven slate released his first uh well not as well yeah maybe his first limiter was the fgx and i just remember everyone talking about how much louder that could make it you know how much louder that could make music than like the l2s which it did and that's i would say steven slate's fgx is what kind of like made me dip my toe into plugins um because of what it could do and then over time you know even though there was a lot of like bad juju with people who used plugins for mastering that kind of slowly went away and then there was a period that you know i was working on a lot of i, I started working with john costelli a lot i started getting to master my first, um, you know, my first Serban mixes, my first Manny mixes. And when, when the people go to John Costelli or Serban or Manny or some of these big, big engineers like Jeff Ellis and stuff, they, they don't want you to impart some crazy, you know, tone. They don't want you to run it through a Fairchild. You know, they want a slightly improved version of the Manny mix or of the Jeff mix or the John mix or Serban mix. So, that's when I really started to um, sometimes going out analog at all would impart too much of a color. Like even just going uh, D to A out, A to D in would impart too much of a color on the mix. Or it would microscopically change the transients or, it would, or how it hit or the timing of things. So I had to start allowing myself to do things digital only when it was appropriate. And probably the first um, first time I did this was maybe 2012, where I was working on a, an album that I really wanted to do a great job on, and half of the songs on there was were digital and plugins only, just because I I couldn't I didn't want to change things too much. I just wanted to set the volume, get it EQ'd right, and um, move on. And then over time, there was a uh, you know, a year or two where most of my masters were all 
in the box, all digital. I would come out from time to time for an analog thing when I really needed it, but I really wanted to dive both feet in and learn how to master in the box as best as I could. And you can't do that if you're constantly going back and forth. And if you're not, you know, like if you want to get really good at this, something like they say, it takes 10,000 hours. It'll take forever to get 10,000 hours if you're once in a while mastering in the box, you know? So a lot of my sound today is based, was, were, was the fruit of those couple of years of really forcing myself to master in the box. It, it's harder to use analog equipment. You got to go through, you got to pass it through, and then you got to, you know, it takes longer, you know, but it wasn't me trying to be more efficient or me trying to save time. It was me trying to be able to have on my tool belt the ability to do a great master fully in the box. And um, a lot of the fruit that came out of those couple of years became what is my sound now because I just dove in and I was like, I want to be able to not only do analog mastering, but I want to be as great of a mastering engineer as I can be, even if I only have pro Q isotope and pro L. A lot of people were asking, there's a mastering chain, like a Dale Becker mastering chain, you know, there, there is, I mean, I, I, um, don't do, I don't do any one particular thing the same way. Sometimes I work with analog equipment. Other times I don't. Um, when I do use analog equipment, it's on something that like I have a little bit more room to impart a color. Sometimes people don't want me to impart a color. I need to be a chameleon mastering engineer. They don't want to hear the mastering at all. They just wanted to hear an improved version of the mix. Other times people want mastering to be transformative. So we'll, we'll go analog and we'll use, you know, if I'm using an analog chain, oft, oftentimes it'll be Laverick conversion, um, the quintessence D to A, and then the, um, I have the, the gold A to D converter, their Mark three. And, uh, and oftentimes it'll be a combination of, um, I use the DW Fern VT5 EQ, and I, I, I like the West Audio uh, NG. I think it's called the NG Comp. Um, it's kind of an SSL style compressor, with you could turn on and off the the transformer and how much the transformer is driven. It's very very cool. And then I, I also like Manly Manly gear a lot. Day to day, we use the Terry Audio EQ. You know all these. These all just impart different colors and have their different, you know, uh, different things that they excel at. From a digital perspective, I it's a little bit more similar. Um, my in chain is uh, typically ninety percent of the time some some version of the Fab Filter Pro L. You know, with I um, have different settings that I've that I kind of go to settings, whether it be on the punchy setting, or transparent, or aggressive you know, for, for the different kinds of things. And I use pro Q a lot, uh, pro Q three from fat filter for my, uh, for my narrow cuts. I used, uh, the Weiss soft tube, the DS -er and the, um, um, DS one Mark three plugin. I had the hardware version of that. And that was always my go-to compressor, uh, compressor and DS -er. So when that came out in plugin form, I immediately snatched that up. I use, um, a lot of, you know, when I need uh, tone and color in the box, I'll, I'll maybe reach for like an Acousticus plug-in. I really like um, their plugins because it their stuff feels very analog-like. Uh, I like the Aaron, the Aaron EQ and the Green EQ. Um, Fire the Clip is amazing uh, for, for getting level. Um, that's an Acousticus one. And then, of course, Isotope. Um, Isotope is on almost everything, um, whether it be just a little bit of the imager or some of the more, you know, kind of creative tools. I'm, I'm almost always have something from Isotope in the chain. Um, but if I were to bring it back to what happens 90% of the time, it's probably some sort of clipper. I'll fire the clip to start the chain to get the volume up and to kind of like lob off some of the heavier transients. And then um, whatever tonal work I'm going to do, whatever EQ I'm going to work do with um, Fab Filter, a bit of DSing with the Sob Tube DSer, 
and then a collection of limiters in stages. Um, I, I'm a big believer. It's something my dad taught me early on in my mastering training uh, was to gain stage limiting. Um, so you don't have one limiter doing all the work and then, then you can mix and match, match color. So, you know, the end of the chain will be some, some, it'll be some collection of both hard what, what I would consider hard or clippy or aggressive sounding um, limiting followed up by a limiter that has a good tone to it so that you can balance, you can balance aggressive, clippy, punchy with something that sounds pleasing to the ear. You know, the, the kind of like forms of limiting that are, are more uh, kind of round and, and deep feeling. What are some examples of like the like the clippy limiting? Probably my first go to would be a mix one of the either fire the clip uh, from acousticas, which is great, um, or fab filter um, on one of the more aggressive settings. They actually have an aggressive setting, and that's a great one for for that form of limiting. Um, a modern is really good. Um, and it is pretty clippy feeling. It's more clippy feeling than like transparent or or punchy in in fab filter. But those would be my main kind of go tos. Also, Isotopes. Um, Isotope has a few limiters. Their vintage limiter in modern mode feels pretty clippy, and you can get things pretty loud. That that was a long time go to for a lot of mixers. That that um, uh, and and me as well as mastering engineer uh, was that vintage limiter uh on modern mode you know in in the analog mode would be kind of more akin to the tonal limiting that i was talking about the kind of the more pleasing sounding warmer rounder vibes now that you have a taste of dale's mastering process let's take a look at some of the specifics of how we mastered scissors sos and that is about the new scissor album scissor sos there is a real broad range of mixers that worked on that project. You had Dana Nielsen, Serbin, Jason, John Castelli, Manny, Rob Biesel, Sean Everett. So was that challenging to master all those different mixers? Five years ago, it would have stressed me out to have so many different mixing styles on the album. But um, uh, over time, you know, you just kind of develop a, uh, a sense for the middle ground, you know, a sense for like a a target that everyone would be happy with it not it's not always possible but on this particular record uh rob who was kind of like the main guy pulling everything together really gave me freedom to do what i thought needed to be done which was so empowering i, I want to honor everyone's mixing styles um on that album i mean everyone's these giant mixers right um and they they mix like they intend it to sound so they don't want they're not going to want some mastering engineer to come in at the in the 11th hour and just start changing things but um i i did have the freedom to do what i needed to do but in a way that i felt i'm always going to try to to honor you know a serban mix i'm always going to try to honor a john costelli mix i'm always going to try to honor all these guys um because you know they're very intentional with their sound um but with the intentionality, you know, it, it also, everything's coming in sounding great. So it's not like I'm mastering like a, a Serban mix uh, mixed with some guy who doesn't know what he's doing. So everyone's mix has sounded really good coming in. The real limiting factor on something like this, say, say you have a one one song, it's, it's mixed by like a Phil Tan who mixes really hot. And then you have uh you know some other mixes that are more punchy and like dynamic the real limiting factor in a in a situation like that would be that the mixes that you have to turn up so oftentimes what i'll do is i'll see how far i can turn up the softer masters while maintaining their punch and integrity and then see how far once i push those as far as i can then i'll see how far i have to pull down the loud master you know and it, the 80 20 rule is also a really good thing to implement here a lot of uh, times earlier in my career i would want everything to be perfect all the levels across all the different masters to be perfect and oftentimes i'll take it 80 percent of the way there 
so that we're not over leveraging any one mix to meet a specific target. Uh, typically, when you get it about 80% of the way there, everyone's happy. You know, the, the listener has a, uh, you know, a solid unified listening level in terms of what they're, you know, what they're listening to. It's, but the mastering engineer in me wants to make those final 0 0.2, 0 0.3 dB tweaks. And I, sometimes I like stop myself and say, you know, 80% of the way there towards the target is good enough. Um, so when we started, we didn't have all of the mixes, you know, so I couldn't, I didn't have a, I wasn't able to look ahead and be like, okay, we have these mixes from this guy, these mixes from that guy. They were just coming in as they coming in. And, and I didn't know, like, am I going to have a man? No, I didn't know who was, what was coming from where I just know, oh, here's five, five more mixes to work on. So what I do a lot of, in a lot of cases, I have some references that I like to listen to that I feel like are good volume. I have a collection of songs that are roughly around the same volume, and they range from everything from a Selena Gomez track that Tony mixed um, and Chris Geringer mastered, to a Loose the Child thing that I mastered, to a Wiz Kid thing, to all, you know these couple of of references that I feel like are both loud, but also are really dynamic and punchy. And so that, that more or less is like my target for volume to start. And then as a project take shape, um, you know, we make adjustments. So some, some projects will end up a little hotter or a little softer than target. And um, really it has to do with like the, what I'm always looking for, like, okay, what is the loudest what what should feel the loudest on an album in terms of dynamics like you know just some giant like low is um one of like should feel loud um uh as opposed to like kill bill which is kind of more of a it i mean it should feel loud as well but it, it it's it's kind of a little bit more of a subdued dynamic so every time i'm setting levels i not only want things to just be at the same volume but i want their dynamics on an album to make sense so if you have full band freaking rocking out um you want that that should feel loud and it should feel a lot louder than a ballad so i always want the ballads to feel a little bit more subdued than like the big rock track so that as you're listening down to an album um you know the the dynamics make sense to our ear and then once we've established like the volumes overall for each of the individual songs, a lot of times I'll do some automation as well um, to make sure that, you know, once we get all the volumes for the loud sections, correct, I'll go back and I'll automate the first verse or intros so that those all make sense. Cause a lot of times, especially when you have different mixers, they, they kind of work differently in terms of dynamics. Some people will mix like a spike stent style of mixing will really push the, if there's an acoustic guitar first verse vocal, it will be pushed kind of like almost as loud as the chorus. And that that's a particular mixing style that's really cool. And then there's other mixing styles that, you know, the mixer really wants that first chorus to feel much louder than the, than the acoustic guitar vocal intro first verse. So the, there's a bit of a, uh, there's a bit of a play there as well, not only in the overall, volumes of the songs but how different mixers you know dynamically process and dynamically mix hope you all enjoyed that interview with dale becker and how he mastered scissors sos if you guys did like the video please don't forget to like and subscribe it really helps out the channel and stay tuned because i got a lot more dale becker content coming anyways have a good day